The story of the giants of the seas began some 55 million years ago, shortly after the disappearance of the dinosaurs. A period of global warming had a major impact on the planet, and sea levels rose. Some land mammals moved towards the water. Among them were the ancestors of the cetaceans, including whales, dolphins, orcas, and toothed whales, which still walked on all fours and hunted on the shoreline. Gradually, they ventured into the shallow waters before beginning to swim to catch their prey. 10 million years later, their descendants finally quit terra firma for good, taking to the oceans. Swimming proved a wonderfully effective strategy, and with the water supporting their body weight, they evolved into titans. That was how the giants of the seas evolved. To go in search of these ocean-dwelling behemoths, we will follow François Serrano, an oceanographer, a former companion of Jacques Cousteau, and a tireless explorer and defender of the marine environment. François will dive alongside the largest animals on the planet in an effort to pierce the mystery of their incredible success. When the land-based ancestors of these cetaceans returned to the seas 55 million years ago, they had no chance. They were entering a hostile environment. They had to breathe. They had to hide in an environment where there was nowhere to hide. In the deep blue sea, there are no hiding places. They had to give birth in an environment where the offspring had to be able to breathe right away. Yet, despite all these obstacles, they thrived. I think what enabled them to succeed was their social living. Social relationships are the key to understanding marine mammals. That is what enabled them to thrive in this element, to conquer the largest environment on the planet. Of all the giants of the ocean, killer whales no doubt have the closest social bonds. Off the Valdez Peninsula in Argentina lives a unique family of killer whales. Francois Serrano is eager to explain what makes them special. Through this particular example, he wants to demonstrate that killer whales, and indeed other whale species, can develop societies of unbounded inventiveness and variety which all deserve to be studied and preserved. Francois is accompanied by Hector Gazin, who is the oldest and most experienced warden of the vast nature reserve that covers the whole peninsula. Can you see anything? On this occasion, Francois will not dive alongside these giants, but will observe them from the shoreline, the boundary between land and sea, where the survival of the killer whales of Valdez is played out. A blowhole. Yes, yes, yes. A large male, a calf, two, three, four females. A group of eight killer whales. It's a family. You say this is the best spot on the Valdez Peninsula to see the killer whales, but they're still a long way off. How can we get a little closer? Closer? Don't worry. They're heading to an inlet called Caleta Valdez. We'll go there and we'll be closer. The tide's coming in. The weather conditions are perfect. So the killer whales will go to Caleta Valdez to try and catch young elephant seals. Okay, so we should go to the Caleta Valdez. At what time? Now. Now. High tide is at 11 a.m. We should get over there. Okay. Vamos? Vamos. Francois is especially keen to see the killer whales of Valdez because this family is so unusual. It has been studied for the past 40 years, and we are only just starting to understand the family bonds, the solidarity and sharing 
that unite all its members. This society is matrilineal, that is, structured around the females, from the grandmother Maga, her sisters Antu and Ishtar, and her daughter Valen, who herself has a newborn calf, Nene, who is Maga's grandson. The family is comprised of some 15 members, including a large male, Juan, the son of Antu and Maga's nephew, who can be easily recognized by his impressive dorsal fin, measuring 1.5 meters. What makes Maga's clan so special? Like all killer whales, they are totally confined to life in the water. They may have evolved from land-going ancestors, and they are mammals that breathe air. But if they are beached, they die, crushed by their own body weight that they can only support in the water. And yet, to hunt and feed, the killer whales of Valdez are unique in that they dare to risk their lives in defying nature. Other cetaceans also exhibit incredible behavior, but the killer whales, more than any other, are capable of innovating. And here in Valdez, this tiny population is unique, in that it has opted to hunt in a world that it no longer belongs to. The marine world is their domain, yet they come to hunt on land. It's an extraordinary step, because it means they have to overcome their innate fear of the shore. You can always do something that is along the lines of what you are meant to do, but when it involves doing the most dangerous thing, risking your life, that's a whole different story. But that's what the killer whales of Valdez achieve. Along most of its coast, the Valdez Peninsula is surrounded by a fossilized reef which makes it inaccessible to killer whales, meaning animals on its beaches are safe from their attacks. But the whales in Maga's clan have learned to exploit a few natural openings. The most suitable is Caleta Valdez, a long lagoon which stretches parallel to the coast. This is where Francois and Hector are going. At this time of year, spring in the southern hemisphere, elephant seals gather for the mating season. When the tide is low, they are safe. The killer whales can only enter the lagoon at high tide and when the currents are weak. Francois watches as the water washes in, filling the lagoon. The conditions look ideal. The waiting begins. Francois uses the time to sketch the very particular configuration of the lagoon, the orientation of the beaches and the currents. He also notes the position of the elephant seals and their movements. The hours pass. The tide goes out. The killer whales didn't show up. It's now a six-hour wait for the next high tide that evening. And as they'd hoped, in the late afternoon, Francois and Hector spot the first blowhole spurts. The male. Five females, one calf, and two juveniles. Are they heading to Punta Norte? Yes, they're heading to Punta Norte. Let's see if they continue on their way or enter the lagoon. We'll have to wait a while for the tide to come in. There is not much water yet, and the incoming current is very strong. Will the killer whales risk swimming through the channel? If they carry on their way, this day of waiting will have been for nothing. That, 
Look, they're going to enter the lagoon. They are approaching the inlet. They're coming in on the current. Wow. That's amazing. Five, six killer whales. Have you seen how shallow it is there? Look, they're coming in on the current. Seven, eight. Maya and her clan swim in without difficulty and head for the few elephant seals which are lying on the shore. I think they're going to attack. Perfect. Watch out, they're coming in at full speed. You see the water moving. They're going to attack. They're attacking. Three of them are out. Look at that attack. Look at that. One, two, three, four. Four of them attack at once and the elephant seal backs away. There's not enough water, you see? The whales are pushed by the current into shallow areas. A veritable death trap for these cetaceans. They decide to beat a hasty retreat, but to do so, they must confront the tidal currents at their peak strength. Look, the group is swimming back up the current. The size of these giants now becomes a handicap. Juan, the big male, and two son is struggling. I didn't think he'd have such a hard time, the big male. Its belly is scraping on the ground. Its seven meter length and four ton weight are suddenly a distinct disadvantage. Yes, the others are making their way out of the entrance of the lagoon. Look at how he got himself off the seabed there. The killer whales in Maga's clan have to give up for today, which underlines just how difficult and risky this kind of hunting is. Unlike the whales, elephant seals have no trouble moving from the water to the shore, despite weighing up to four tons and measuring five meters in length, almost as much as the female killer whales. At sea, they are powerful swimmers. They undertake vast journeys, covering several thousand kilometers, and can dive hundreds of meters deep in search of fish, which is more than the killer whales are capable of. Now, as they do at the same time every year, they have returned to Valdez to give birth and mate. At sea, they are too powerful and too fast. And on the beach, they are out of harm's way. It's only along this thin strip of shoreline where they are vulnerable. And the whales and Magas clan have worked out where this weak point in the seal's defense system lies. Francois and Hector go closer to the shore, where this clash of the titans will take place. They take up position overlooking a large group of elephant seals. A large male surrounded by his harem. Is it the big male? The big male. The big male, yes. It's a big male. And he has an impressive harem. 
this male get 40 females. Sí. Look. Cada macho tiene Each male has some 40 females. Sí, and he must fight with the other males to keep them away from his harem. Unlike killer whales, elephant seals are always fighting. These constant battles are not conducive to building a lasting social group. Once he has established his harem, the big male has to maintain his hold over it through force. Even mating with the females, who are much smaller than him, seems to be done through force. He has no choice but to fight to preserve his dominant position. Whenever a younger male comes near, the big male is ready to engage in a bloody battle. They're going to fight. They're going to fight. It's anarchy. A total free-for-all, survival of the fittest. It's the opposite of the killer whale's social structure. Here on the Valdez Peninsula, there are two giants, the killer whale and the elephant seal. They seem ungainly on the beach, but they are incredible swimmers. They can dive up to 1,400 meters and navigate as far as Antarctica. But that power is just about all it has in common with the killer whale, because their social organization is totally different in every way. Among killer whales, there is solidarity, learning, a handing down of experience. Elephant seals are all about individualism. The only thing that counts is reproduction. Beyond that, they don't pass on anything. They pass on even less of the experience they have acquired because the females only stay with their young for three weeks. As soon as the young are weaned, their mothers abandon them. So there's no real transmission. So we can see that these two societies are opposites. And yet, these two giants share the same environment, and that's where they come into conflict. Thanks to their solidarity and cooperation, the killer whales manage to feed on young elephant seals, which the adult seals watch disappear with total indifference. Left to fend for themselves, the young have no protection. Some 10,000 are born every year on the beaches of Valdez. Their mothers suckle them for just three weeks, but that's enough for them to swell from 40 kilos to more than 120. From then on, the mothers no longer care for them. They are exhausted by carrying their young, giving birth, and the weeks of feeding. They must now allow a male to mate with them. The young seals have to learn to swim by themselves. Their mothers never accompany them into the water. 
they have no idea of the risks they run. No one has taught them. When they thrash about in the water flapping their flippers, they make a characteristic slapping sound, which signals their presence to the killer whales. Maga and her clan know exactly what that sound means and make a beeline for it. But for them to pick up the sound of seal pups, they need calm seas with as little background noise as possible. Sheltered from the crashing of the ocean, the Valdez Inlet provides the perfect hunting ground. The killer whales try to remain as discreet as possible. They even stop communicating. It's radio silence. Sometimes they are just inches away from a meal. But experience has taught them they must be patient and keep trying. Fewer than half of their attacks are successful. At last, they meet with success. This is the work of Maga, the matriarch. None of them know better than she how to ride a wave to lunge in at the right moment. Even when she seems to have missed her prey, she manages to trap it under her head before getting her teeth into it. Maga drags it out into deeper water. She is hunting for the others, including Juan, the big male, who cannot master this technique and must simply watch her at work. Some whales never manage to learn this method, and others are still too young, but they can all depend on the extraordinary solidarity of the eight females who know how to hunt on the beaches. Valen, Maga's daughter, usually takes part in the hunt. But this year, she has stayed in the open water to take care of her calf, Nene. Maga will take care of feeding the both of them. Valen and Maga do not fight over the catch. On the contrary, they set about dividing it up to share. Once in pieces, Valen's son Nene can come and take his share, which his mother carefully feeds to him. The adults will divide up the rest. Maga the hunter eats last, or maybe we'll even wait until another time. This extraordinary behavior is rarely seen in other species, where the dominant individuals take the lion's share. For these whales, it's all about solidarity and sharing. have been able to develop this rare quality because their matrilineal society is an extremely stable structure. Nearly all land and marine mammal species, both males and females, 
leave their original group once they are mature and join another group with which they then live. But killer whales remain part of the same family for 40, 50, even 60 years, during which they form a unique bond. Around the world, each population of killer whales lives in isolation from others and thus develops its own dialect, its own hunting tactics, its own culture, just as Maga's clan has done in Valdez. Similarly, in the North Atlantic, killer whales hunt in groups, which is the only way to bring together the vast shoals of herring which come to the fjords every year to spawn. The herring's elusive movements make them particularly difficult to catch. And one tiny herring is not as nourishing as an elephant seal. So the killer whales cooperate to surround and concentrate the fish. Some whales swim below to drive the fish towards the surface. Others disorient them with the sounds they emit. The fish panic and bunch together. Then the whales can strike the shoal with the flick of the tail. Each powerful blow stuns a large number of fish. The whales can then take their time to swallow them down. We see the same intelligence at work as in Valdez, that spirit of cooperation that only a close-knit society can produce. Many of these specific behaviors are still unknown to us. Scientists have, however, discovered some of them, such as this extraordinary behavior filmed in the Antarctic by Dr. Ingrid Visser, an oceanographer from New Zealand and her crew. The killer whales have spotted an isolated seal on a chunk of ice that has come away from the ice shelf. They put their heads out of the water one by one to size up the seal's position. There's the calf. They are accompanied by an adolescent of six months. He watches the adults attentively. He's eager to learn. Despite being surrounded by the whales, the seal is still safe on the ice. After some minutes, the killer whales swim off, apparently giving up. They give up our seal. In fact, the whales regroup a short distance away, then rush towards the piece of ice, diving beneath it, creating a wave in a bid to dislodge the seal. They make several attempts, but the chunk of ice is in a spot where they cannot get up enough speed. It's no problem for the whales. They assess the situation, and several of them set about pushing the ice to a spot that is less encumbered. Yep, they're pushing the ice flow. They launch another attack. No way. Four of them. Four of them. Four of them. There it is. He's got it. He's got it in his mouth. Yep. But the killer whales aren't done yet. They don't eat the seal. They put it back up on the ice. 
There's the seal. It becomes clear that they are practicing. Perhaps to show the youngster the art of this kind of hunting. They're training. This is just a training session, I think. Such a group strategy can only work if there are very strong, complex social relations. Above all, this allows the adults to oversee a long apprenticeship for their young. A tight-knit social group and unfailing solidarity also provides care and protection for the young. Among sperm whales, taking care of the young is a job for everyone. When a mother has to dive thousands of meters to hunt squid, she cannot put her offspring in the shelter of a den or a burrow, as her distant ancestors might have done. In the deep blue sea, there is nowhere to hide. When she dives into the abyss, she has to leave her calf in open water near the surface, at the mercy of predators. another female will take care of it until the mother returns from her hunting expedition. She may even take care of several calves at once. Gathered around her, they form a sort of whale kindergarten, a notion that is curiously familiar to us. The female has foregone hunting on this occasion. This is more than just simple cooperation because there is no personal gain for her beyond the good she does for the community. Just like Maga, the female killer whale who hunted for her kin in Valdez. The whole clan thus participates in the protection and education of the young, either by turns or collectively. A newborn may even be suckled by several females, making it sometimes difficult to know which one is its actual mother. Safe in the bosom of the group, the calves have time to play and the time to forge bonds. is one of the keys to the success of these societal groups. Whichever the species, the young remain alongside the adults for many years. They have a luxury that few animals enjoy, on land or at sea, of spending years learning and exploring. This precious time allows for transmission of knowledge and sharing the long experience these cetaceans acquire, sometimes over a lifespan of more than a century. And it is this time that allows the young to discover the secrets of complex behaviors, such as hunting in the Antarctic ice, or of perilous counterintuitive techniques, like those used by the killer whales in Valdez. But how does this education actually work? To answer this fundamental question, Francois meets up with an old friend in Argentina, Roberto Bubas. He was the first person to study the transmission of this extraordinary behavior of hunting on beaches in Valdez nearly 30 years ago. He has forged a special relationship with these killer whales. No one knows them better than him.
That is in Querita Valdes. This is Punta Norte. Punta Norte. Wow, that is really outstanding, yeah? This is... <laughs> you are so small. No, <laughs> if a sea lion is swimming there... Yeah, 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 yeah. Easily hunted. Yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. My first year in 1982, I was taking records hmm. in my notebook, and, and one of them, one of the orcas, came to the shoreline with, a, with kelp in their mouth and put the kelp in the shoreline, like this, let's say. They offer you the kelp? Yes, so I said, maybe she's offering me a piece of kelp, so I, or maybe they want to play sure. with me, so I, I took the kelp, and saw the kelp again to the water, and, and they bring the kelp again to me. Yeah. And after that day, they were waiting for me to play with kelp at the same time in the same place during maybe six or seven days in a row. So it was very, very magic, very moving moment. Yeah. So they did with you what we human beings do with a dog. So they, they, they give you something to, to bring it back. Actually, to. they had the <laughs> initiative. They, they take the they, initiative. Yes. You already did the news that uh, they can catch sea lion and elephant seal? I already knew, but I, I already had a kind of confidence regarding that they were not dangerous to humans. So I, I started to play them, the harmonica, like uh, my, my offering to them. So they're very curious and sonic animals, so I think they started to hear the sound. Uh, also when you talk, with them, they are very curious and they bear, pay attention to that. So, how do the all females share their experience with youngs. Well, this is one of my findings. No? Only five adult females are who keep this uh, knowledge of the intentional standing and they trespass this knowledge to the offspring. Um, at six or seven months of age, very, very, uh, when they are really pups yet, they started to teach the pups to go to shallow waters. They do this behavior when uh, the water is calm, not very rough or windy. And after that, two, uh, two or three years old, these pups start for first time to strand themselves, sometimes in beaches which there are not food, no? not available prey, just practicing this intentional stranding behavior. So, this is Maga? Maga and Agustin. Agustin. Mm -hmm. no, uh, this is a typical teaching behavior. Mm -hmm. typical. The mother or the grandmother show the behavior and then uh, the okay. juvenile copy the behavior and the female help the baby to come back to deeper water. Roberto Bubas was the first person to film this educational behavior which is extremely rare in the animal kingdom. Francois is determined to see this training the adult females give to their young with his own eyes. To him, it's even more important than the powerful emotion of the hunt or those precious moments of sharing that we have witnessed. This could totally revise our vision of killer whales changing their status from ferocious predators to members of a harmonious and caring society. He and Hector take up their positions, ready for a long wait if necessary until the conditions are right.
as they do every day, the whales eventually show up. But this time, they ignore the beaches full of elephant seals and head for the north of the inlet, with its long strip of land where there is practically no prey. This is a good sign. Better still, there is a young calf in the group, possibly Valen's son, Nene. Hey. See them there? Look at the killer whales over there. There's a big male and an adolescent. Yes. He's going to strand himself. They're going to come near the shore together to teach the youngster how to strand. The calf is indeed reticent about going near the beach. The female encourages him, showing him how it's done. He follows. And when his instinct kicks in, making him want to turn back, she stops him with a tail movement. She is clearly blocking him from returning to the deeper water. She pushes him farther up the beach. She forces him to remain beached for a moment to overcome his instinctive fear. Then, once she thinks the lesson has gone far enough, she helps him back into the waves with another flick of the tail. Is the female Maga? Yes, it's probably Maga. Yes, it's Maga pushing the young one. Maga is the most experienced female in the clan. She is the guardian of the practices of the Valdez killer whales. To pass on her knowledge, with the help of the other females, she will encourage the younger whales to repeat the exercise along the length of the lagoon. Day after day, month after month, year after year, she trains them how to strand and free themselves over and over. As if that were not enough, they also have to learn to spot and then catch their prey, elephant seals or sea lions on the beaches of Valdez. It will take the most gifted, up to 15 years to become accomplished hunters. Then they too have to pass on to the next generation the art of intentional stranding, the specialty of the Valdez clan. To begin with, there were only two whales that could do this. The story could have ended there. But most likely, some females observed these two males, imitated them, and then, as good matriarchs, passed the skill on to their young. It takes years before the hunters can finally catch their prey. That shows that, first off, it's very hard to learn and that this innovation, which has been passed on, and which requires a very complicated apprenticeship, is a behavior that is specific to this very small group. That's what makes Valdez extraordinary. It's something you cannot see anywhere else, and which makes this small population of killer whales, today there are about 13 or 14 who can do this, unique in the world. So unique that they cannot be replaced by any other group. It gives this family the importance of a species, since they are irreplaceable. 
And I think that elsewhere in the world, if we paid more attention to killer whales, we would see that each family has its own culture. And I do mean culture, which makes it unique. If each group is irreplaceable, then each of them deserves to be studied and protected. Because the loss of a few experienced females, guardians of these special skills, would mean the end of the specific culture of the Valdez clan. No doubt, the same goes for all killer whales around the planet, with each group accomplishing feats that none of the others could even imagine. And what goes for killer whales is probably also true for sperm whales, dolphins, and other species of cetacean. For they are more than just species. They are societies, families, and clans. This long journey through the world of whales and dolphins shows us that we must totally revise how we understand them and how we must protect them. We are at the start of this stunning exploration to discover a whole new world that is the home to these titans of the deep.